Hi everyone, welcome and thanks for joining me today. So this is part two of my series of two lectures on some simple climate models. Part one was on deterministic models and now the second part will be on stochastic models. And for once, uh, this time I will also show some result of my own research. I don't do that usually on this channel, but in this case it is rather fitting. But let me start by giving a recap of part one. So I talked about climate in the past and in particular ice ages. So we are currently in the Quaternary Ice Age, but we are in an interglacial phase called the Holocene. And climate data show that in the last uh, several hundred thousand years, there has been this alternation between interglacials and glacial phases. And this we know thanks to uh, data in geology, in chemistry, so the analy analysis of ice cores and marine sediments, and uh, paleontology. Now, if you zoom in on the last uh, glaciation, you see that it hasn't been cold all the time. There have been these warming events called uh, dansko oeschke events, so Actually, the behavior of the system is quite complicated. And I also talked about causes of these climate changes. So one of them is Milankovitch cycles. So this is changes in the orbit of the Earth. The major factor being the eccentricity of the orbit. Changing the orbit changes the amount of sunlight that hits the Earth and it has an impact on climate. And this correlates quite well with these changes on scales of 100,000 years. But then when you look in more detail at these dansko oeschke events, for instance, you see that the reconstructed temperature follows this uh, average uh, solar insulation, but uh, there's something more going on. So the system seems to be bistable, so to switch back and forth between two states at two sides of this red dashed curve. Now, what causes these uh, bistable oscillations? So one likely cause, according to climate scientists, is changes in the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, or AMOC for short. So this is a system of ocean currents that is part of the global thermohaline circulation. Thermohaline meaning that it is driven by temperature and salt concentration differences. And here we have what happens in part of the North Atlantic with the, the Gulf Stream that is mostly driven by westerly winds that brings a lot of warm water to the North Atlantic and then bifurcates in several uh, different major currents like the North Atlantic Drift. Now, one thing that has been observed is that there are some very specific areas of the coast of Greenland where this warm current starts sinking and then it flows back closer to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. And it is believed that this is mostly due to the fact that the ocean water carries a lot of salt, so it is quite heavy. But if large parts of the ice sheet on Greenland would melt, that would dilute the seawater and it could at some point stop sinking. And so we can have actually transitions between two states, so the current excited or interstadial state, and another basic stadial state where this AMOC goes much less far to the north. And then I also talked about different types of climate models, so going from very detailed general circulation models that are computer models, including the dynamics of the atmosphere, the ocean, land masses, ice sheets, and so on, down to very simple box models. And I argued that the simple models, why 
you can't really use them for predictions. They are useful to understand some basic mechanisms and to make sense of what you see in these detailed simulations of the GCMs. And the simplest of these box models is a model where you have just one box, which is the Earth. And uh, you can write a differential equation for the temperature of the Earth. And the time derivative of the temperature is proportional to a sum of two terms. So the first one is the incoming solar radiation, which I'm assuming here to be periodic in time, though it's in general more like quasi-periodic. And then there's a term of outgoing radiation that contains the uh, thermal radiation of the Earth and the reflected part of the incoming radiation, which is given by a coefficient called albedo times this incoming radiation. And if you put all this in an equation, you get a certain differential equation with a gamma of t here that depends on the albedo. Now, the difficult part of modeling is, of course, to find how the albedo depends on the global or average temperature on the Earth, because it has to do with the extension of ice sheets, of cloud cover, and so on. But you can make some simple assumptions and come up with a right-hand side, which is the minus the derivative of such a double well potential. So you have two stable states and one unstable states in between. And this is changing periodically in time. So this is what you can do for simple models. And then you can make this model more and more complicated. But this is the point where uh, adding noise to the system uh, enters the scene. And that's an idea that was proposed by the climate scientist Klaus Hasselmann in the 70s. So what he argued was that typically what you do, even if you simulate such a GCM, you have a system of coupled partial differential equations, which is quite complicated. And when you simulate it, what you always do is that you truncate somehow the the sizes that you simulate. So, for instance, you can use a Fourier basis, and then you will only simulate wavelengths uh, which are larger than some minimal size. And so the question is, what do you do with the smaller wavelengths, which are in general also related to uh, quicker fluctuations, so shorter periods in time. And one thing that is done in climate models is called parametrization. And that means that these uh, short wavelengths, you could just throw them away. But a better thing to do is to say that these short wavelengths are a function of the part that you simulate. And this function is based on observations or maybe some mathematical model. That is a little bit similar to what you do in statistical physics, what's called the BBGKY hierarchy. That is when you go from uh, equations for individual particles to kinetic theory and then later to fluid equations. So you can write equations for moments of the uh, particle distribution. So the first moment would be the density, and then you would have the velocity field, and then the energy. And this hierarchy gives an infinite sequence of equations for these moments. So each moment will depend on higher order moments. But then in order to be able to study the equations, you will at some point truncate this hierarchy by saying that the second moment you, or the third moment, you just replaced by a function of the first moments. However, what Hasselmann argued is that it may be actually a better idea 
to represent these unresolved, these non-simulated modes by something stochastic, something random, so random noise. And there are actually a number of justifications in simplified models for, so, so they say that uh, this is indeed uh, something that you can do. So, for instance, there uh, are studies of systems like uh, a harmonic oscillator or a slightly more complicated system that you couple to a field of infinitely many harmonic oscillators. So the oldest works go back, uh, to my knowledge, to Ford, Katz and Maser. And you can show that under some assumptions on the coupling between the smaller system and this bath of harmonic oscillators, that its effective dynamics is indeed governed by what we call a stochastic differential equation. And there's another related approach which is called a stochastic averaging and that applies to systems where you have slow and fast degrees of freedom. Now let us look at what happens when you add noise to this simple double well model I just talked about before where I have this double well that is excited periodically in time. So here, this is actually the very first simulation I put on my YouTube channel. So you see uh, this little particle which represents the state. It oscillates in this double well potential and it is subject to noise, so that's why it makes these fluctuations. And the thing you, that you see is that it spends most of the time at the bottom of one well, but from time to time it goes from one potential well to the other one. It doesn't necessarily do this at every cycle, at every oscillation. That will depend on parameters like how deep the potential wells are. So for instance, right now it stayed in the same potential well, but for the parameter values I chose here, it quite often goes from one minimum to the other. And this is a phenomenon that is known as stochastic resonance. So the phenomenon was introduced by two uh, different groups of people, an Italian group and a Belgian group in the early 1980s. So here is the equation that describes what we just saw in the simulation. So I say here that the variation of my position is some drift term times the time step plus a random time, a random term that is uh, my noise term. And this drift term here so if this a cos epsilon t is not there, it is a term that has two stable states in minus one and one and an unstable state in zero. And when you add this oscillating term, you, you get this, so this you can write as minus the derivative of a double well potential. And here I've shown this potential for three different values of time. So that's what we saw in the simulation. Now, here are some examples of sample paths for fixed epsilon, quite small, and different values of A, the amplitude, and sigma, which is the noise intensity. So when A is equal to zero, you have these occasional transitions due to noise but they are completely random in the sense that the distribution between, so of times between jumps is uh, actually completely independent of time. So actually you can show that it is quite close to an exponential distribution. So the transition times are close to what we call a Poisson process. But then when the amplitude is increased, the, the jump times become dependent on where you are in this periodic cycle. 
So for instance, here you see that we tend to jump at points where, so these curves represent the, the two local minima and the maximum of the double well potential. So the jumps occur with higher probability when the minimum you are in is close to the unstable maximum. But here you don't jump at every cycle, and here finally you do jump at every cycle. And this is called stochastic resonance. So why, where is the resonance? Well, you have two important times here. One time is the period of the oscillation, and the other time is the typical time it takes for the noise to make your particle jump over the, uh, the saddle, over the potential maximum. And this phenomenon is most visible, most prominent, when these two time scales are close to each other. Now, this is just to show you that there's a huge literature on stochastic resonance. So, and here, that's only, so to speak, the, the tip of the iceberg. So I put here a few very early references with an emphasis on mathematical results and a few over, uh, overview articles. So people have analyzed this phenomenon uh, using different techniques, reduction to Markov chain, the Fokker-Planck equation, techniques from uh, signal processing. They have looked at specific regimes, so very slow forcing. Uh, they uh, have looked at uh, small amplitude forcing and many other different cases. And while this model was introduced specifically for these climate systems, it is still kind of controversial whether it is a, a good model. Probably it's not because it's too simple, but stochastic resonance showed up in many other areas, for instance in, uh, in neuroscience. And also it has technological applications because you see it's a way of amplifying a weak periodic signal. So stochastic resonance has become kind of a field in itself. Now, I want to talk here about a particular regime, which is more or less what we saw in uh, this uh, simulation I showed before. So I'm looking here at a stochastic differential equation again with a certain drift term that could be the term I showed before, this uh, bistable term and a certain noise term here. And so here's an approach that I introduced with my co-author Barbara Gantz uh, a number of years ago, which is the following. So let's assume that F of space and time vanishes on a certain curve x star of t, which you see in black here. And then if there's no noise, so when you also assume that this is a stable curve, meaning that it will correspond to a potential minimum, then you can show that there is a trajectory x bar of t, shown in blue here, that tracks x star at a distance of order epsilon. So x star of t itself is not a solution of the equation, but x bar is. And then what we showed is that when you add noise to the system, and the noise is not too strong, you are likely to remain in a certain neighborhood of x bar, which is shown in cyan here. And this neighborhood has a size which is proportional to the square root of a quantity v bar, which goes like the inverse of the curvature of the potential well. So what this means is that if the well is quite flat, the curvature is smaller, and therefore v bar is larger, and so this set b of h is broader, while if the potential well has a stronger curvature, it's very steep, then the curvature is larger and the strip is na narrower. 
Now, more precisely, the thing we showed is that the probability of a solution of this equation, so here is a particular solution sample path shown in red, the pr probability of leaving this set before time t has the following behavior. It goes like time times exponential minus a constant close to 1 times h square, which is the parameter controlling the width, over sigma squared, over 2 sigma squared. So what this means is that you have like a confidence interval in statistics. So you know that as soon as you take h a bit larger than sigma, so maybe 2 sigma, 3 sigma, this probability will be very small, at least on long time intervals, and so you are very likely to remain in this strip. Now you can extend this approach to the what we call the synchronization regime, which would be the case we saw in the last example here in the last panel, where the amplitude of the driving is quite large, and so you have transitions which are frequent. So, what we mean here uh, is there is a critical amplitude of the forcing, and that is the amplitude which is such that you, your double well potential actually can become a single well potential if A is larger than this critical value. So, we assume here that we are still below this value, so the amplitude is a bit smaller than this critical value and it's smaller by a small quantity delta. And then what we were able to show is that there are two regimes. So one of them is when the noise intensity is small compared to a critical noise intensity given by this maximum of delta, distance to this uh, critical threshold, and epsilon, which is the frequency of forcing to some power, 3 over 4. So if the noise intensity is small compared to that threshold, it's very unlikely to observe transition. So your particle will always remain in the same potential well. Whereas if the noise intensity is larger, then you have this synchronization behavior where it's very likely to go from one potential well to the other twice per period. And a more precise formulation of this result is the following. So for weak noise, the transition probability is exponentially small in this sigma critical over sigma squared, while for large noise intensity, it is close to 1. Now, let me return to uh, the other climate model I talked about in the first lecture, which is this box model by Stommel, which is a very simplified model of the Atlantic meridional overturning synchronization. And in this model, we had two boxes at low and high latitudes. Each one has its temperature and uh, sol salinity, salt concentration. And these temperatures and salt concentrations vary due to three mechanisms. So the first one is that you have more heat from the sun in the lower latitudes. The second one is that this heat causes evaporation, which uh, forms clouds, and many of them drift to the northeast, and uh, they come down as rain in the, in the North Atlantic or on Europe, and that will dilute the salt concentration. And the third mechanism is that due to the difference in uh, so salinity and temperature, you have a difference in density, and that causes a slow exchange between the two boxes. So this model is too simple to account really for this uh, phenomenon of meltwater from Greenland uh, interfering in this AMOC, but it's interesting nevertheless. 
So you get these two equations by making some simple assumptions. So you have here a term given by this temperature difference due to different uh, amounts of energy from the sun. You have the fresh water flux and you have the mass exchange between the two boxes. And then what I said is that you do some scaling, so you pass to non-dimensional variables and you find a certain equation with two non-dimensional variables. So x is proportional to temperature difference, y is proportional to salinity difference. And uh, the most important parameter mu here is proportional to the freshwater flux. And epsilon is uh, small, it's a time scale separation, so it reflects the fact that the response of temperature differences is faster than the response of salinity differences. And you can even simplify the system by just saying that x will remain close to 1, and then you get this one-dimensional equation for y. And what's interesting here is that if you plot the equilibrium points as a function of the fresh water flux, you get this S-shaped curve. And it shows that for intermediate values of the fresh water flux, you have three equilibrium states. The outer ones are stable, the inner one is unstable. But for high and low fresh water flux, you have only two. Uh, only one equilibrium state. And if you now imagine a scenario where, let's say, we are in the regime with a large freshwater flux, and now for some reason the freshwater flux were to decrease, we could move to this regime where suddenly the state we are following disappears. So that's called a tipping point. And then the system will go to another equilibrium with much less uh, flow, and that would correspond to this stadial state. Now, if we analyze what happens when we add noise to such a system, what you can do is locally near such a tipping point, the equation for y will look something like this. So this minus y square minus epsilon t derives from a potential that changes from a potential with a maximum and a minimum to a potential where there's no equilibrium point near y equals zero. And that is what happens near a tipping point. So we have the state which tracks the, the stable equilibrium here. But then at some point, this equilibrium disappears. It kind of annihilates with the, uh, the unstable state here. And then our system will start reacting to this disappearance, and uh, it will go to the other stable state. And so you can do a very similar analysis to what I've shown before, and you find several things. So the first thing is that when you approach this tipping point, the fluctuations due to noise will grow, and they will grow like, okay, something that depends, it's proportional to the noise intensity, and it decreases with time, where time measures how close I am to the tipping point. So the tipping occurs at time zero. I start with negative times and then I have the tipping at time zero and then I go to positive times. And so what you see is that when you approach the tipping point, the size of these fluctuations increases. And then two things can happen depending on how strong your noise is. So if the noise is not too strong, and that means if sigma is smaller than the square root of epsilon, then it is very unlikely that your system will react actually to this tipping point before the tipping occurs. So it will do 
approximately the same as what it would do without noise. However, if the noise intensity is larger than square root epsilon, what will happen is that with a very high probability, very close to one, you will actually make a transition already before the tipping point. So you see here the effect of noise is that a transition due to a tipping point can actually occur earlier. And in particular this fact that the, the variance, the fluctuations, increase when you approach a tipping point has been used by people in climate science to try to detect tipping. So because, you know, when you have a system and it approaches a tipping point, once you have reached the tipping point, uh, there's nothing you can do. But you could say, uh, is it possible to detect that the fact that you approach a tipping point to maybe do something against it. And so you can use this, how the, the variance, the size of fluctuations grows to uh, try to predict the fact that you approach a tipping point. And there are uh, a few more things you, you can do. So uh, here, what we did is that we looked at uh, different regimes and what happens when you have an S-shaped curve like that. And you change the, so you move your parameter, your freshwater flux, say, periodically. And you change the amplitude of the periodic forcing and the noise intensity. And then what you find is that there are three main regimes. So the first one here is a regime where the amplitude of the forcing is small. So smaller than the distance between the two tipping points, or it can be very sli slightly larger, but not too much. And then you're likely to make a small cycle near one of the stable states here. Then there's a regime where the amplitude is large, but the noise intensity is not too large. And then you will have this hysteresis cycle where with high probability you will remain in a small neighborhood of a deterministic cycle. And then there's this case where uh, actually whatever the amplitude of the forcing, when the noise is large enough, you can have these early transitions and uh, so you will already uh, make a transition from one stable state to the other one before you reach the tipping point, which is very similar to what we have seen in this stochastic resonance. So these were some examples of stochastic climate models, stochastic simple climate models. So to conclude, maybe uh, you wonder what would happen if indeed the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation would revert to its stadial state. And there are a number of climate scientists who believe that this could happen in the future. Well, we don't really know, but based on previous observations, so one thing that could happen is that the climate in northern the North Atlantic and so in, uh, in Europe and uh, in the, at the east coast of North America would uh, resemble more uh, something which is known as the Younger Dryas. And the Younger Dryas is a period uh, that occurred between about 13 and 11,000 years ago when there, following the last glaciation, there uh, there came a, a climate warming, but then there was a cooling again that lasted for over a thousand years before warming started over. And there are many records and fossils that uh, show that this was the case. And the climate in the Younger Dryas so was colder and probably quite windy and also quite dry. And it is 
believed that this could be related to such a, a reversal between interstadial and stadial regimes. And what this would mean is that it would give a much colder climate in Europe and parts of North America. And that would of course cause problems because it would be more difficult to grow crops, for instance. Now, one thing that has been suggested is that because we have this global warming now, maybe this global warming that didn't exist during the Younger Dryas could actually kind of compensate this, uh, uh, this cooling. However, I have two problems with this uh, scenario. So one of them is when you have two opposite mechanisms, well, it's the probability that they exactly compensate is very small. So what can happen is that they will somehow result in a new equilibrium, but we don't really know what it will be. So how cold, how warm it will be. And it doesn't need to result in a stable situation. It could also result in something unstable, where we have a lot of going back and forth between different climate regimes. And another problem is that this would affect the climate locally, so mainly around the North Atlantic. Of course, it will have consequences elsewhere, but you see, we still have this problem of uh, the greenhouse effect uh, increasing the total heat on the Earth. So if you have a cooling in some places of the Earth, it will even increase the warming in other parts, which will again cause instabilities and so on. So what should we do? Well, that is discussed at length in many places and uh, probably all know that. So. The most important thing, of course, is to reduce CO2 emissions. And that can be done by using more renewable energies, uh, also by building carbon sinks and so on. Uh, but this you may say that's for the government to do. Uh, but there are also things that you can do as a person. For instance, you can improve the insulation of your homes. You can try to use your cars less, so use public transportation, use bicycles, other means of travel. You can reduce air travel. So these are small things, but if many people do it, it can make a difference. So if you ask what I'm doing, well, I haven't owned a car in over 10 years, so I'm mostly traveling by bike. So that's why I put on this T-shirt today. And I also, significantly reduced my air travel, so I use the train much more if I can. So this year I've only used the plane once, whereas maybe 10 years ago I would take the plane more like over five, six times a year, maybe more. So that's it for today. Thanks a lot for watching. I hope you enjoy this presentation. And Hope to see you soon again, so take care, bye.